Then comes the major surgery, the removal of the man and the formation of the woman. A woman born at the age of 24. A new life is begun. The body of the woman within begins to appear now. The world is shocked by a person who changed his sex. Thus, the strange case of Glenn, who was Glenda, one and the same person, not half man, half woman, but nevertheless, man and woman in the same body. He dares to enter the street dressed in the clothes he so much desires to wear. Glenn is engaged to be married to Barbara. Glenn's problem is a deep one, but he must tell her soon. She's begun to notice things. Soon she will realize. He learned that foreign doctors were doing marvelous work with a sex change. Man to woman, woman to man. Say, did you read about the guy that had his sex changed to a girl? Says he was perfectly normal, too. How can a guy be normal and go and do a thing like that to himself? What about their children, Doctor? Uh, would their children uh, become the same way their father is? Glenda has made the decision. If the newspapers had not gotten hold of the story, it would have gone untold, unnoticed as so many others in medical history. Why is the modern world shocked by this headline? Why? Do you realize what would happen if every man in the country that wanted to wear women's clothes or felt like a woman went to their doctors and wanted a sex change? Glenn and all the hundreds of thousands of other Glens across the nation face quite a problem. groping of things unknown, drawing from the endless reaches of time, brings to light many startling things. <laughs> startling because they seem new. Most are not new to the signs of the ages. 
their own thoughts, their own ideas, all with their own personalities. One is wrong because he does right. And one is right because he does wrong. Pull the string. Dance to that which one is created for. A new life is begun. A life is ended. See that note. The records will tell the story. I was put in jail recently. Why? Because I, a man, was caught on the street wearing women's clothing. This was my fourth arrest for the same act. In life, I must continue wearing them. Therefore, it would only be a matter of time until my next arrest. This is the only way. Let my body rest in death forever in the things I cannot wear in life. Inspector Warren is here to see you, Dr. Alton. Oh, yes. Uh, show him in, Miss Stevens. Doctor? Doctor? Sit down. Thank you. You're a very busy man, Dr. Alton, I know. I appreciate this time you're giving me. Business or pleasure, Inspector? In a way, uh, business. 
from policeman to inspector. 20 years of it. <laughs> I guess I've seen everything there is for a policeman to see. Yet I wonder if we ever stop learning. Learning about which we see. Trying to learn more about uh, an ounce of prevention. I'm a man who thrives on learning. We only have one life to live. If we throw that one away, what is there left? Doctor, I'm hoping to uh, learn something from you. And with that knowledge, maybe save some human from a fate which I just witnessed a few days ago. A four-time loser. This type of case comes to me as well as yourself many times during the course of one month. The suicide? The suicide. Most of us have our idiosyncrasies. This fellow's was quite pronounced. Yes, but I wonder if it rated the death warrant it received. I don't think so. Well, that's why I'm here today, Doctor. What do we do about it? I've always heard you to be a hard-hearted policeman, Inspector. <laughs> Isn't that what's thought of most policemen? The laws are written. The policeman is hired to see that those laws are enforced. We have a job to do. As in most jobs, there's always somebody who doesn't want that job to be done. In most factories today, the employer has put up suggestion boxes. Even the employer needs advice once in a while. I think in the case that we're referring to, I need advice. Maybe it shouldn't have happened as it did, but it did. Perhaps the next time we can prevent it. Let's get our story straight. You're referring to the suicide of the transvestite? If that's the word you men of medical science use for a man who wears woman's clothing, yes. Yes, in cold, technical language, that's the word. As unfriendly and as vicious as it may sound. However, in actuality, it's not an unfriendly word, nor is it vicious when you know the people to whom it pertains. Would the sex operation do these people any good? I understand you were quite prominent in a case that hit the headlines a few weeks ago. In some cases, yes. Others, no. Well, the papers certainly had a field day with that one. Strange as it may seem, even though it was a field day, as you so aptly put it, it's not a new story. Sex change has been performed many times. Those whose sex can be changed, they're the easy ones. But what of those who so desperately want to be of the opposite sex, yet can't change their sex, such as was the case with Patrick, Patricia, the suicide? I'd like to understand this, Doctor, as best you can tell me. You can only fully understand the sex change by taking two entirely different cases. Two men with exactly the same background, from childhood to manhood, and onto their own decisions and destinations. I'd like to hear the story to the fullest. Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. Young man, though he is, speaks the words of the all wise. No one can really tell the story. Mistakes are made. But there is no mistaking the thoughts in a man's mind. One might say, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Why is the modern world shocked by this headline? Why? Once, not so very long ago, the people of the world were saying, Airplanes. <laughs> Why, it's against the Creator's will. If the Creator wanted us to fly, 
need to give them us wings. But we fly. Maybe some of you may still remember an even sillier remark. Automobiles? Bah. They scare the hosses. If the Creator had meant for us to roll around the countryside, we'd have been born with wheels. Silly? Certainly. We were not born with wings. We were not born with wheels. But in the modern world of today, it's an accepted fact that we must have them. So we have corrected that which nature has not given us. Strangely enough, nature has given us all these things. We just had to learn how to put nature's elements together for our use, that's all. Yet, the world is shocked by a sex change. If the Creator had wanted us to fly, he'd have given us wings. If the Creator had meant us to roll around the countryside, we'd have been born with wheels. If the Creator had meant us to be boys, we certainly would have been born boys. If the Creator had meant us to be born girls, we certainly would have been born girls. Are we sure? Nature makes mistakes. It's proven every day. This person is a transvestite, a man who is more comfortable wearing girls' clothes. The term transvestite is the name given by medical science to those persons who wear the clothing of the opposite sex. Many a transvestite actually wishes to be the opposite sex. The title of this can only be labeled Behind Locked Doors. Give this man satin undies, a dress, a sweater, and a skirt, or even the lounging outfit he has on, and he's the happiest individual in the world. He can work better, think better, he can play better, and he can be more of a credit to his community and his government because he is happy. These things are his comfort. But why the wig and makeup? He dares to enter the street dressed in the clothes he so much desires to wear, but only if he really appears female. The long hair, the makeup, the clothing, the actual contours of a girl. Most transvestites do not want to change their life, their bodies. Many of them simply want to change the clothing they wear to that as worn by the opposite sex. Glenn is engaged to be married to Barbara, a lovely, intelligent girl. Those fingernails have got to go. You know, I didn't realize they're as long as they are. My goodness, they're almost as long as mine. Maybe even prettier. We'll have to paint them sometime just for the fun of it. We'll trim them. That's for sure. You know, honey, you've invited me to dinner so many times in the last couple of months. It's almost like we were married already. I wish we were, darling. It's been a long year. For both of us. But now, my studies are through, college is concluded, and I'm free at last. Free? For the time being. Huh? Oh. oh. How about joining me for an after-dinner drink? In the living room? Mm-hmm. Modern man is a hard-working human. Throughout the day, his mind and his muscles are busy at building the modern world and its business administration. His clothing is rough, coarse, starched, according to the specifications of his accepted job. At home, what does modern man have to look forward to for his body comfort? The things provided for his home, a wool or flannel robe, his feet encased in the same thick, tight-fitting leather that his shoes are made of. These are the things provided for his home comfort. It doesn't look so comfortable, does it? And get the hat. Better still, get the receding hairline. Men's hats are so tight they cut off the blood flow to the head, thus cutting off the growth of hair. Seven out of ten men wear a hat, so the advertisements say. Seven out of ten men are bald. But what about the ladies? Yes, modern woman is a hard-working individual also, but when modern woman's day of work is done, that which is designed for her home comfort is comfort. Hats that give no obstruction to the blood flow. Hats that do not crush the hair. Interesting thought, isn't it? Just for comparison, let's go native. Back to the animal instinct. 
there in the lesser civilized part of the world it's the male who adorns himself with a fancy objects such as paints frills and masks the true instinct the animal instinct bird and animal life is it not so that it's the male who is the fancy one could it be that the male was meant to attract the attention of the female what's so wrong about that where is the animal instinct in modern civilization female has the fluff and the finery as specified by those who design and sell little miss female you should feel quite proud of the situation you of course realize that it's predominantly men who design your clothes your jewelry your makeup your hair styling your perfume but life even though its changes are slow moves on there's no law against wearing such apparel on the street as long as it can be distinguished that man is man and woman is woman. But what is it that would happen were this individual to appear this way on the street? You're doing it now, laughing. Yet, it's not a situation to be laughed at. Thus, the strange case of Glenn, who was Glenda, one and the same person, not half man, half woman, but nevertheless, man and woman in the same body, even though by all outward appearances, Glenn is fully and completely a man. Hey, sister, let me borrow her dress. You want to borrow your sister's dress? What for? I want to wear it to the Halloween party. There are names for boys who go around wearing girls' clothes. Oh, don't be silly, darling. You go ahead and wear your sister's dress, Glenn. You always did look much better as a girl than you do as a man. Glenn did wear the dress to the Halloween party. He even took first prize. Then, one day, it wasn't Halloween any longer. I wish I had the sight into such things to be able to advise you, Sheila. Maybe... Maybe if you took the problem to a doctor. It's Glenn that needs the doctor. But... But when things like this go wrong with someone so close and, and in your own family, it's so hard to believe. It's not really hard to believe. It's just hard for you to accept. Well, of course it's hard for me to accept. Suppose I, I were to come home with Roy or one of my other boyfriends some night and find Glenn like I did last night. Yeah, that would be hard to explain. That's the understatement of the year. Just how does one go about introducing your friends to your brother when brother's wearing your best sweater and your skirt and makeup to boot? Glenn is not a homosexual. Glenn is a transvestite, but he is not a homosexual. Transvestism is the term given by medical science to those persons who desperately wish to wear the clothing of the opposite sex, yet whose sex life in all instances remains quite normal. Would you be surprised to know that this rough, tough individual was wearing pink satin undies under his rough exterior clothing? He is. Then there is your friend, the milkman, who... who knows how to find comfort at home. I can't stand it any longer. He wears all my clothes. Nothing is sacred to him, even my briefs. He has every one of my sweaters stretched out of shape. Of course, he has always replaced them, but then... They didn't last long, either. But your honor, ruffles on his shirts and shorts, really. 
Glen and all the hundreds of thousands of other Glens across the nation face quite a problem. Glen is engaged to be married to Barbara, a lovely, intelligent girl. The problem? Glenda, Glen's other self. The girl that he himself is, his other individual personality. You look tired tonight, Glen. Yeah, I guess I am. It's been a long day. Have you seen the paper yet? No, why? It's headlined. A man had his sex changed to a woman. Isn't that a strange case? I wonder how some people's mind works. Well, some people aren't happy the way they are. I suppose so, but to change one's sex, that's a pretty drastic step to take. If it's the only way, I'm for it. I wonder what I would do in a case like that, if I were in the mental turmoil that that person went through. Or if I suddenly realized that something was mentally wrong with you. Ooh, it's hard to visualize. Here we are, two perfectly normal people, got to be married and lead a normal life together. And there's this poor fellow who never could have been happy if it wasn't for modern medical science. Our fourth term in psychology explains a lot of the facts. But I'm afraid the end of study is only the beginning of reality. Glenn's problem is a deep one, but he must tell her soon. She's begun to notice things, his nails, his eyes when he looks into a lady's store window. So many of the little things that are hard to hide. Soon she will realize. Then there was the time Barbara was wearing the sweater Glenn had always wanted to feel on his own body. It was becoming an obsession to him. He must have it. What's the matter, Glenn, darling? <laughs> I guess I was daydreaming. Something seems to be troubling you. Why don't you tell me? It's nothing. Once, long ago, just after we started going steady together, we promised we'd never lie to each other. Are we gonna start now, just because we're engaged to be married? It's just that... Oh, Barbara, it's nothing that a little sleep won't cure. It's been an awful long day. It's more than that. Come on, tell me, darling. Who knows? Maybe I can help. That's just it. You could. Then something is troubling you. Yes. Do I have a right to know? You have a right to know. But let's just say for the moment that I'm afraid to tell you. I'm afraid I'd lose you. Nothing could be as bad as all that. I love you, and you love me. And nothing in the world can change that. I hope not. I really hope not. Glenn, is it another woman? must be told. Always the same. He's not had the nerve to tell her. But he must soon come to some conclusion or forget the marriage. Should he tell Barbara of his Glenda now, before the wedding, or hit her between the eyes with it after, when it might be too late for either of them? The world is a strange place to live in. All those cars, all going someplace, all caring humans which are carrying out their lives. The world is shocked by a person who changed his sex. Glenda is shocked also, but by another reason. Someone like her had the nerve to do something factual about their situation. There are so many problems for Glenn and all the other Glenns. Perhaps the fear of discovery of the underthings they wear beneath their regular outer clothing, or that which they wear during their nightly visit to Morpheus, god of sleep. Thank you very much, and I'm sure she's going to enjoy it very much. If you want to return it, be sure that you bring the sales slip. Thank you. Can I help you, sir? Yeah. Let me see a nightie. Well, what size? Twelve. 
Uh, the color, the material? Black? I'm very sure. Just a minute. Well, we have this here. Would you like that? Something like this? As lace? Yeah. Perhaps he admires the material too long. You can see how sheer the material really is. Yes. You see, it's all pure nylon and only $21.95. And of course, it will never snag. But Glenn and Glenda and all the Glens and Glendas have an even bigger problem. Homosexual, it is true, at times does adopt the clothing or the makeup of a woman to lure members of his own sex. But this is not so for the transvestite. The transvestite is not interested in those of their own sex. The clothing is not worn to attract the attention of their own sex, but to eliminate themselves from being a member of that sex. Hi, Joe. How you, Jack? Monday again. You know, I think Monday is about the worst day of the week. A perfectly wonderful weekend, then back to the sweatshops. Too bad he was born to work. Say, did you read about the guy that had his sex changed to a girl? Says he was perfectly normal, too. How can a guy be normal and go and do a thing like that to himself? All the same, it must take a lot of guts to pull a stunt like that. That's a problem I don't ever intend to face. Maybe it's a problem we should all face. I don't get you. Just think of the unhappy life. The miserable time this world of ours must have given that poor guy. I still don't get you. Now, here is a guy who wanted to be a girl. Supposing there had been no way to change his sex. You sound as if you're really head up on this thing. I guess I am. Do you realize what would happen if every man in the country that wanted to wear women's clothes or felt like a woman went to their doctors and wanted a sex change? Of course. That's why I say perhaps society should be a little bit more lenient with them. Maybe society should try to understand them as human beings. Another day, Don. Thank goodness. See you tomorrow, Jack. So long, Joe. Until tomorrow. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Johnny. Come on in and hit it right for the kitchen. I can't let that dinner burn. You know, I thought I was going to have to eat alone tonight. Well, you probably will because I've already eaten. I guess I got a problem. Haven't we all? I mean a real problem, one like I've never had to face before. Our whole existence is one big problem after another. I want to get married. You have a problem. When did this all come about? For nearly a year, I've been engaged to a very wonderful girl. Now the time is getting very close to the man with the book. I'm scared to death. You love her? Very much. Does she love you? Yes. There's no problem. Marry the girl. Are you forgetting about my other self? You'll have to tell her, of course. Yeah. I have to tell her. But when? Before? Or after? I think you know the answer to that one yourself. My mind's in a muddle, like in a thick fog. I can't make sense to myself sometimes. 
I thought I could stop wearing these things. I tried, honestly, I tried. I haven't had a stitch of them on for nearly two weeks until tonight. Then I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to put the monogram out of my mind. I'm afraid I'll lose her. I don't want that to happen because I really love her. Okay. Here's a story from fact. Johnny tells his story. He had not too long ago been married himself. He had kept quiet about his transvestite desires in the hopes that the new wife would never discover it. However, one day, the little woman came home unexpectedly an hour early. That marriage ended here. Will your problem be like mine? Most probably it will. Because her love hasn't been built up for such a thing. She, your wife, she will not have been taught enough about the problems to cope with it. Glenn, Glenda must now make her decision or forever forget the marriage to Barbara. Glenn, Glenda should consult a competent psychiatrist, but then very few transvestites wish to change their strange desires. This is their life. To take it away from them might do as great a harm as taking away an arm or a leg, or life itself. Many even carry their transvestite desires to the grave with them. Yes, it is a problem. But Glenda, remember back almost a year ago when Glenn and Barbara accepted each other? Okay. That's the sixth time you've said goodnight. I guess it is. Look. Come on over here a minute. What is oh, it? Never mind, just sit down. You mean you will? What do you think? When? I must finish college first. It's only seven months to go. Well, then that's hardly long enough for you to get a trousseau together. How would you know about such things? <laughs> I was, huh? That's a mighty pretty dress you're wearing tonight. I wear my best to please you. You know, when when you look at me, you just tie me in knots. I love to tie you in knots. Oh, I'll be so happy when these next few months are over. Some special reason? Of course. So you can stop kissing me goodbye at the door every night. Yes? So you can hold me close to you always. Yes. Then all you'll have to do is call and close your eyes to feel my lips on yours. on your doorstep. He eats little boys. Bobby duck tails and big fat snails. Be there. Take care. Be there.
Miami, dragon. Do you eat little boys? Puppy duck tails and big fat snails?
Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys, puppy dog tails, and big fat snails. Beware, take care. Glenda has made the decision. Glenn has decided to tell Barbara of his dual personality. To tell her of the nighties and negligees, the sweaters and skirts, the robes and dresses, the stockings and the high-heeled shoes, the wig and the makeup. All that goes to make Glenn into Glenda. He tells Barbara he cannot cheat her of the knowledge that she, as his fiancée, should possess. All the facts. He tells her softly, hurriedly at first, then slowly as he becomes more technical. His hands move to caress the smooth material of her Angora sweater, which he has so long and so desperately wanted to put on his own body. He tells of this to her, and she looks to the sweater and to his hand. Then, when it is all over and that much of the story he knows is told, Barbara is not sure of her own thoughts. That's about it, darling. I wanted to tell you for a long, long time, but just couldn't bring myself to do it. I've been too much afraid of losing you. understand this, but maybe together we can work it out. the end of the story? Not quite. I'll get back to it in a minute. Glenn's case is really the lesser advanced type cases. The second case is an extremely advanced one. However, I'll get to that in a moment. First, you must realize that the world over has its own particular problem. Each case must be handled individually according to the person, his past life, and his problem. Did this Glenn have any homosexual tendencies? Absolutely not. It's very seldom that a true transvestite does. And he isn't a hermaphrodite? No more than he's a pseudo-hermaphrodite. Glenn's case was entirely of his mind, brought on by the environment of his early youth. What about their children, Doctor? Uh, would their children uh, become the same way their father is? No. Transvestism is not hereditary. Well, what makes these men want to wear girls' clothes? Many things. But as I've said before, it usually starts in early childhood from one cause or another. Technically, each case has the same beginning, just a different set of circumstances. Are any of them actually cured? Oh, yes, many, many of them. Once the source of supply is found, it can be stopped, unless the patient refuses to cut off that source of supply. Then the way I get it, this Glenn and the character he created, much as an author creates a character in a book, was invented as a love object to take the place of the love he never received in his early youth through lack of it from his parents. The character was created and dressed and lives the life the author designs for him to live. 
and dies only when the author wants him to die. Correct. Except that for the character Glenda to die, the elements must be right. But to enlighten you a little further, there's the second story, that of an extremely advanced case. Let's call this person Alan, Ann. Alan had a mother who wanted a little girl. The father didn't care much one way or the other. Alan did not enter the competitive sports that the other boys at the school did. However, he was an extremely studious boy and always had above average marks in his subjects. Yet sports, girls' sports, he always was interested in. But he was rejected by the girls and also rejected by the boys. It seems he belonged to neither of them. After school, Alan would go home to find the mother who had always wanted a girl and the father who didn't care one way or the other. He enjoyed doing the woman's work around the house. Alan was becoming a woman and didn't realize it. A woman in mind only, but the mind rules. Then came the fateful year of 1941. Alan was drafted. He was accepted. In the Army, he successfully passed his vigorous training. He did not like it, and there were the weekends for his particular diversions. On his weekend passes, he would go to the nearest town where he had a suitcase checked in a public locker. In the suitcase, he had the things he loved to wear, that which made his body appear to be what his mind believed it was. Then the day of embarkation came. But wherever Alan went, the suitcase was sure to go. As quickly as it had begun, the war was over. Alan came home. Alan had learned all the terms directed at men like himself, but no one had found out his aversion. He was honorably discharged from the service at the end of the war. He'd received the Silver Star and the Bronze Star for gallantry in action. While he was in an army hospital recuperating from a wound he'd received in New Guinea, he learned a very interesting fact. He learned that foreign doctors were doing marvelous work with a sex change, man to woman, woman to man. Shortly after his separation from service, Alan came to me for advice. There followed many long sessions with my clinical reports and the reports of eminent doctors. It had been found that Alan was really a pseudo-hermaphrodite. A hermaphrodite is one who has the organs of both the male and female in plain sight. A pseudo-hermaphrodite is one who has one perfectly formed organ of either sex and one imperfectly formed one that's difficult to detect. Alan was of the latter. Alan was then given his choice. That which nature had given him was a mistake. It was up to us to correct that mistake one way or the other. Alan had to decide whether he wanted to become a man or she wanted to become a woman. Both were completely possible. Small bone, fair of complexion, his hair thin like a woman's, his body slim, hips slightly girlish. It was easy to see his decision, along with the fact that he had been brought up from early childhood to believe that a woman was the thing to be. Alan decided to become a woman. This, after all the help I could give him, was only the beginning. During the following two years, he was to go through the tortures of the damned. But never was there a whimper from him, because he knew that at the end of it all, he would at last be that which he had always dreamed. Hundreds of hormone shots were injected into various parts of his body. 
Alan's face was worked on with plastic surgery to smooth out the female elements. Long, tedious hours of work. The big day, or the starting of many big days, for it was to take many. The series of operations are performed slowly and at intervals to prevent any unnecessary shock to the nervous system. Still, the hormone shots continue. Day after day, week after week, month after month. And even then, when the operation is over, the sex has changed, the shots must continue as long as Alan lives. First, the breasts are brought out. The body of the woman within begins to appear now. But in time, Alan is Anne, a very happy, lovely young lady that modern medicine and science has created almost as a Frankenstein monster. The newspapers heard of it and hit the story with their usual fullness. Papers had not gotten hold of the story, it would have gone untold, unnoticed as so many others in medical history. The sex change has been performed hundreds of times. However, right here in this particular sex switch, it's not the end. Acting the woman and being the woman are two entirely different things. Alan had all his life acted the part of the woman. Now he is that woman and must learn how it's done. Anne must learn how to do her own hair, how to make the correct styling for her facial contours. The proper walk must be adopted. A lady is a lady, whatever the case may be. Continuing my own psychiatric treatment, it was my duty now to explain to Anne the duty of a woman in her sex life. Alan, of course, had known the man's, but he was soon to realize he knew very little about a woman's. Yet, through it all, Anne loved every minute of it. Anne was indeed meant to be a woman, and now that the sex change had been completed, Anne was a very happy woman, and a woman who was eager to learn, and now was accepted by society. A woman born at the age of 24, in a world that for 24 years she had seen as a man, but a woman who now would, and was properly instructed in how to accept a woman's world. Thus, this case, which has a happy ending, is due entirely to the corrections made by medical science. I've had several such cases. In fact, in my 20 years of practice, I've been prominent in seven. However, my colleagues have had hundreds. Then you believe that the Glen of the first story should have the sex change? In Glenn's case, no, no indeed. Glenn would never be happy with the sex change. The Alan of your story ended happy? I'll tell it to you exactly as I told it to them. Shortly after Glenn told Barbara of his love for girls' clothing, he started treatments with me. 
On the last treatment, both he and Barbara came to me. I told him the same story of Alan, Anne, as I've told it to you, Inspector. Anne was a pseudo-hermaphrodite. Even though one of the sexes was imperfect, she had the organs and the characteristics of both the male and female. Glenn's case is an entirely different type of case. Remember I said, no matter what the case, it's a different thing. A new problem to be looked into, then solved. A new challenge to the psychoanalysis. Glenn's body holds only one sex, that of the male. In all our talks, I've learned these pertinent facts. Glenn's father had no love for his son. His father wanted Glenn to be a football hero or a baseball player so that he could brag to his cronies down at the corner saloon as his cronies bragged to him about their own sons. Thus, the ruse of Glenn's fictitious character. He invented it when he could find no love from his mother and no love from his father. His mother had hated her own father. Glenn reminded her of her father. Therefore, she gave all her affection, love, and attention to her daughter. Glenn then decided also to become a daughter. Glenn, you can kill this fictitious character of yours any time you wish. For your happy ending, it's the only way. Then you think I can kill this second character by transferring her qualities to Barbara? Exactly. But as the author and his character, the elements must be right. It's up to you, Barbara. You must take the place, give the love, and accept the facts that Glenda has always accepted. If you love each other as you now believe you do, well, it'll be a hard job, but you'll enjoy doing the job. Should I let him continue to wear girls' clothing, or should I put my foot down? If you put your foot down, he'd only go behind closed doors. Love is the only answer. Glenda must be transferred to you. Supposing Glenn never gets over wearing girls' clothing? Would it matter to you very much? I love Glenn. I'll do everything I can to make him happy. married life, the remembrance of the psychiatric treatments, and Barbara's love and understanding, Glenda begins to disappear forever from Glenn. Glenn has found his mother, his little sister, his wife, and his Glenda all in one lovely package. Thus, Glenn's case has a happy conclusion. Therefore, two entirely different cases handled in two entirely different ways have a happy ending. Yeah, those two. But what of the hundreds of other less fortunate Glens the world over? Fortunate Glens, the world over. Oh, snips and snails and puppy duck tail.